Welcome to First Mover, your first global look at today's action in the Bitcoin, blockchain, and digital asset space. I'm your host, Christine Lee. Joining me are my co-host, Quintus Managing Editor of Global Capital Markets, Lawrence Luton, as well as Managing Director of International Content, Emily Parker. Good morning, Emily and Lawrence. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. Welcome back, Em. All right. Checking in on Bitcoin, the Quintus Bitcoin price XBX index currently trading at $48,385. Bitcoin is sliding almost 3% over the past 24 hours. And the Quintus Ether price ETX index is at $3,971, below that $4,000 threshold now, retreating about 1.5% for the day. And the DFX Coindesk's DeFi index is trading at 397 points. Also, DeFi is down about 2%. The most reliable reference prices for institutions since 2014 are now published under the Coindesk brand, just globally as the leader in crypto news events and data. All right, so we're seeing a bit of a retreat over the weekend. Lawrence, what's happening with the markets? Nothing. I, I, I mean, it's, it's just basically nothing. I, there's no other way to describe this. Um, we have... People are buying it, you know, Bitcoin for Christmas, just a little. No. I mean, they, they, no. I mean, some people are, sure, they're buying a little bit. Why not? I, they, they do that every day. They don't care what, I, they're, they're a bunch of, you know, faithless people anyway. But um, it, it, it's more about, like, where are they positioning themselves with, with uh, the, the, the macroeconomic uh, uh, situation going forward, if they're going to be doing that. I mean, you, you know, you look at uh, some of the pro- some of the projections for where the S and P will be next year, and and you're, you're, people are talking in the high in the low five thousands, you know, fifty two, fifty three hundred, about ten, twelve percent from where we are right now. Um, so there is a, this sense of bullishness uh, for the market in general. Yet it hasn't fully translated into crypto just yet, and uh, that will remain to be seen if there are more buyers and sellers. And that's kind of like, it sounds like a joke, but as Umkar Godboli reported uh, today, that we've seen some Bitcoin getting out of the markets, out of the exchanges. That's bullish for Bitcoin because it means in general that uh, there are fewer Bitcoins to buy. So we'll see if they actually do come out to the market to buy it. Haven't done it yet. All right. Emily, speaking of macroeconomic factors, what are you looking at in terms of uh, a lot of central bank movement? Yep, there's going to be a lot of central bank activity this week. We have, I think, a total of 17 central bank meetings happening all over the world, including in Japan, in Europe, in the United States. There's a Fed meeting for two days on the 14th and the 15th. And, you know, if you believe that this is somewhat related to Bitcoin's price, which some people do, Lawrence does not, um, you know, we might see the Fed signaling raising interest rates starting next year, which could have an impact on Bitcoin's price. And just in general, I think everybody's going to be looking to see what the forecast is for inflation. So there are definitely some people in the crypto community that think this might have an impact on Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Well, let's take it's a look at some DeFi. <laughs> Badger Dow recently revealing details of how it was hacked for $120 million. The DeFi platform saying an application platform that runs on its cloud network was the vector for the attack. Joining us now to discuss further is Jonathan Manzi, CEO of Beyond Protocol, a blockchain project that focuses on trust and security. Welcome, Jonathan. Thanks for coming on the show. So perhaps we can open up with what made BadgerDAO vulnerable to an attack. What happened here? Well, BadgerDAO is a terrific Web3 application. And unfortunately, Web2 went awry as it often does with kind of archaic technology as it relates to authentication and identification. And there was a vector for attack that was not related to smart contracts in Web3, but Web2, specifically injection of code into uh, and on top of a web surface, which essentially had uh, bad actors run off with $120 million. Not anything against Web3 tech, but just deficiencies and problems in integrating in bridging Web 2 to Web 3. So, Jonathan, um, uh, first of all, good morning. The, what was interesting, I, I, you know, reading the blog post from, uh, from Badger, uh, they said that it was an, unauthorized users were able to create accounts on BadgerDAO. So how, what, what happened there? How exactly did that happen? And, and that exposed them to that sort of vulnerability. 
And it seems to have been going on for weeks, correct? I mean, wh- how did it happen in that regards? How did, were they able to create the gay accounts? And how was it able to go on for so long? Yeah, so the, the way right now, we'll, we'll, to go back to the kind of transition that I was discussing between Web 2 and Web 3, Web 3 kind of being this on-chain, everyone can track and see transparently what's going on. There's an integration on the front end on Web 2, meaning that you as a wallet holder, let's say on Badger DAO, can opt into certain actions happening. People can, on your behalf, or programs and smart contracts on your behalf, send your money um, or coins to another wallet. And as it relates to the months prior, weeks prior activity that was unauthorized and led to this exploit, the uh, bad actor essentially was able to go into the layer that integrated this Web 2 interface with Web 3. It's called Cloudflare and penetrate it with unauthorized access, basically pretending that they were engineers and developers that needed API access to Cloudflare from BadgerDAO's team. They, in fact, were not. It seems to be a deficiency, as BadgerDAO has uh, said in their community posts, in what Cloudflare had put together as authentic- authentication into being able to get into the API knitting um, on, on their side. And what you end up happening is bad actors that are supposed to be Badger DAO people um, having access to this place on the, the bridge from Web 2 to Web 3 where users interact. And basically, as those users are interacting, deciding that they could transfer their money from um, one location to another, all of a sudden, the bad actor comes in to the website and says, all right, type in your info here. Uh, it looks like the money's supposed to be transferred where, it's, where, where you think it is, but it's actually going to my wallet. So it all kind of comes back to the week, weeks prior, there was um, uh, unauthorized access. Someone who purported to be a Badger DAO engineer getting access into um, Cloudflare and then from Cloudflare, the vector of attack, being able to then make these calls out to the website and on the website, users who you know were experiencing these kind of hacks come in or these these messages come in saying, "Oh yeah, that's cool. Uh, it, it's okay for for uh, this money to be uh, potentially sent here at some future date and time." When in fact that that wasn't um, what what they wanted. So, Jonathan, how do you prevent something like this from happening in the future? Do you need KYC requirements, more personal identification requirements? Is that even possible with DeFi? So, yeah, no, there, there is a bright future moving forward, and it, it relates to being able to go to these problems of unauthorized access and bring them on chain. Uh, right now, they're off chain. So the guy who or girl who penetrated the BadgerDAO um, API uh, profiles on Cloudflare, um, they, they were kind of using things like two-factor authentication. We've learned that the two-factor authentication for some of those reports might not have even uh, been in place properly. But th- this can be prevented if the authentication and the verification happens on chain, not kind of in this way that is happening with Web 2.0 with devices uh, being used uh, moments later to authenticate. But let's say, for example, the technology Beyond Protocol has developed when the device of the person is that's supposed to have the API access only when that device signs the transaction with its microchips and everyone in the environment, all the concerned stakeholders can vouch for the fact that that signature is in fact the device holders, then the transaction moves forward. This is a a way to make it probabilistically impossible for there to be a DeFi exploit. That's technology, for example, Beyond Protocol is developing. But it's these types of technologies that say, look, Web3 is the future and we've got to when we're bridging from Web 2 to Web 3, we've got to tighten things up. It can't be such a patchwork. This is how you solve the problem. Jonathan, just to follow up on that. So you talked about some things that can be done on the technology side, but what about on the regulatory side? So these kind of hacks definitely spook governments. Um, and, you know, is there anything that can be done 
from the regulatory side to prevent hacks like this going forward? I know with DeFi, it's even more challenging. Yeah, you know, the regulatory side, what what it seems like um, it, it, it is the role of good of good regulation is to kind of look back at what has happened and learn from uh, things that might not have been so great, learn from things that do look good and promising and have been great, and then propose a framework moving forward that can bring out the best features and uh, the best um, uh, kind of wisdom of, of new technology, innovation. And as it relates to, you know, DeFi, there's some amazing things that DeFi un- unleashes. Uh, there, there's there's ways um, uh, agencies that provide regulation can integrate with it and provide stronger regulation with it. And what they could do is look at how to put down a framework, a technological framework where there are guards and traffic lights set up um, on this road from web two to web three. So things like this don't happen. And there's certainly a lot of great innovation in the world right now that it makes this immediately possible right now related to device to device communication and authentication. All right, Jonathan, thanks for breaking it down for us. That was Beyond Protocol CEO, Jonathan Manzi. Coming up, checking in on Asia and a crypto markets update with Eagle Brook Advisors. I'm Christine Lee. It's Zach Seward. I'm Michael Casey. I'm Christy Harkin. I'm Isaiah Jackson. I'm Serena Lynn. Hey, this is Will Fox Lee. I'm Teresa Santos. Hi, I'm Lawrence Lewiston. Hi, I'm Dorian Wayne. I'm Nikolai Stey. Hi, I'm Kevin Worth. My name is Naomi Brockwell. I'm Jordan Mutra. Hi, I'm Galen Moore. Hi, I'm Brad Cow. I'm Pete Paschal. Hi, I'm Jen Sanasi. You're watching, and you are watching, and you're watching Coindesk TV. Time now for the daily forecast and update on what's happening in the Asia crypto markets. Here's Angie Lau of Forecast News. Welcome to the Daily Forecast, December 13th, 2021. I'm Angie Lau, Editor-in-Chief of Forecast News, covering all things blockchain. Well, Binance Asia Services has withdrawn its application for a license to run a cryptocurrency exchange in Singapore. We're going to take a look at what that all means for the future of the company in the city-state and a whole lot more coming up. Let's get you up to speed from Asia to the world. Let's kick off with some of the top stories coming out of Asia today. First up, did Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi really say India was going all in on Bitcoin on Twitter? No, he did not, because his account was hacked on Sunday with the attacker posting a fake tweet saying India had officially adopted Bitcoin as legal tender. They did not. The false tweet was quickly taken down and a message saying the account had been secured posted instead. It is not the first time Modi's account had been compromised here. It was among those affected in a huge Twitter hack last year that also hit Elon Musk and Joe Biden's accounts. Over in China, Yunnan province says it has eliminated the illegal supply of power from small and mid-sized hydropower stations to Bitcoin mining. Amid China's efforts to intensify the clampdown on crypto mining, authorities in the province said that 246 hydropower stations had been ordered to stop supplies in a move that could save up to around 2 billion kilowatt hours of power a year. You can find those stories and a whole lot more on forecast.news. Now, over in Singapore, a huge decision for one of the world's leading crypto exchanges. Binance Asia Services says it has withdrawn its application to the Monetary Authority of Singapore for a license to operate a regulated crypto exchange. Forecast News' Timmy Shen has more. The exchange had operated in Singapore under an exemption which allows companies to provide services while the license applications are being processed. However, this withdrawal puts an end to that, and Binance says its fiat to crypto trading platform Binance.sg will wind down operations and close by February 13th, with new registrations and deposits shut down immediately. Binance says it plans to refocus operations in Singapore into a blockchain innovation hub and that it will explore initiatives including incubation programs and blockchain education. For Forecast News, I'm Tini Shan. Well, the end of the year is fast approaching, so what better time to look at the key developments in the digital security space we've seen this year and 
how we might tokenize the world in 2022. And who better to ask than Henry Chong, CEO of Fusang. Their aim is to reshape investment markets with blockchain technology. Great to have you with us, Henry. Great to be here, Angie. So a report by Deloitte published late last year suggested security token offerings could be the next phase of evolution for financial markets. What progress have you seen this year on the development of the market for them? And and, and how do you see that changing? Security tokens will inevitably be the next phase of evolution in capital markets. Almost all shares today are fundamentally represented by pieces of paper. And even if they aren't physical pieces of paper, we have pictures of paper, PDFs. Tokenization will allow us to actually digitize shares for the first time in 400 years. And once we do, we can start to marry the best benefits of crypto assets with the real world uh, securities out there, shares, bonds and funds and allow access to a global investor base, the kind of products that they just couldn't get access to ever before. Now, we know there's been a lot of bad press in the past over ICOs and fraud cases. So what do investors need to understand about how STOs work to potentially help them understand the market, allow them to participate a little bit more? The interesting thing about security tokens is that, as I said, you take the best elements of technology while keeping the best elements of how traditional securities legally work. There's no particular reason to redo how a share works legally. We just need to move away from the paperwork to a digital token. Just like how we shifted from offline shopping to e-commerce, once we can tokenize these securities, we can start to allow people to create, list, trade, and transact them in a radically new way. Tokenizing the world one security token at a time. Henry Chang of Fusang, thanks so much for joining us today. And thank you, everyone. That's the daily forecast from our vantage point right here in Asia. For more, visit forecast.news. I'm editor in chief Angie Lau. Until the next time. The Crypto Markets Update is presented by Grayscale, the world's largest digital currency asset manager. All right, checking in on Bitcoin. The coin is Bitcoin price XVX index currently trading at $48,114. Bitcoin is down about 3.5% over the past 24 hours. The coin is Ether price ETX index is trading at $3,922. ETH sliding about 2.7% for the day. The new DFX, Coindesk's DeFi index, is trading at 394 points right now retreating about two and a half percent. Joining us now to discuss the crypto markets is Joe Orsini, Director of Research at Eagle Brook Advisors. Hello there, Joe. So Lawrence mentioned earlier that a few thousand Bitcoin has been taken out of exchanges. Inflation is at its highest since we've seen in three decades. These are all bullish signals, but we're still seeing the crypto markets in retreat. Why is that? Sure. Thank you for having me on. So I think there's a number of factors for maybe the near term uncertainty in crypto markets. Again, just as you said, it's the uncertainty related to the Fed's process of normalization, and that's really the pace of tapering, as, as well as the number of hikes in 2022. So naturally, that will weigh on risk assets and Bitcoin included. Um, does not change the long-term thesis. The long-term thesis certainly remains intact. Um, hi, just to follow up on that. So we have a lot of Fed meetings uh, coming this week, including from the US Fed, which will be uh, tomorrow and the day after. Do you see any immediate impact? I mean, once it becomes clear that interest rates are likely to rise next year, do, do you think you will see an impact on price? Because there's some controversy about this in the crypto community. Yeah, so so we're really seeing maybe more correlation with uh, maybe near-term inflation expectations rather than the level of inflation. And so if you kind of look at break-evens, they've come lower in, in, you know, since the middle of November, which also highlights you know, the highs that Bitcoin placed in November as well. So. Um, it's really kind of how the Fed does navigate, you know, the supply chain issues and concerns over inflation and how they remain transparent with, with their plans. And, you know, we think transparency is most important rather than kind of their actions thereof. So, Joe, I mean, it, but it, it, it counter to this is that maybe ha- have we run out of steam with Bitcoin and are, are investors instead looking to, say, ETH and some of the other uh, layer ones, some of the alts there? Uh, because they kind of view this this whole rally in Bitcoin due to inflation sort of run out of steam. It's gone as far as it can go. What else can you do with it? And so now they're looking for greener pastures. 
You know, that would, that would certainly make sense. Um, you know, as investors understand the different use cases from different projects and protocols and, and they can kind of see the difference in drivers of returns, it does make sense that they've maybe diversified outside of Bitcoin. However, Bitcoin's longer term thesis is really, you know, increasing demand for a hard, you know, hard coded scarce asset. And that's not going to change. Um, in terms of kind of traditional finance and traditional portfolios, they're really just getting their feet wet in terms of understanding at Bitcoin in their portfolios. And that's still really in the early innings of, of really just gaining exposure for both institutional and even retail investors. So Joe, in terms of your clients, are you advising them to buy right now? Or, and if so, would they buy Bitcoin or other altcoins? So our clients are, you know, interested in all things, mostly Bitcoin for now. Uh, Bitcoin is the easiest to understand in terms of the wealth management, RA industry, and really, again, just beginning to invest there uh, as well. So, um, you know, Bitcoin, we always say Bitcoin should be the first step for every investor into digital assets. ETH should be second, and then we can have the conversation about other altcoins and different use cases, et cetera. All right, Joe, thanks for the insights. Appreciate your Markets take. That was Eaglebrook Advisors Research Director Joe Orsini. Coming up, 2021's top blockchain unicorns and checking in with Coindesk Global Policy and Regulation Managing Editor Nick Day. Hi, everyone. My name is Naomi Brockwell, creator of NBTV and co host of The Hash, and you are watching Coindesk TV. Welcome back. Time now to check in with Coindesk Global Policy and Regulation Managing Editor Nick Day, who is also the editor of Coindesk's The State of Crypto Newsletter. Good morning, Nick. All right. So we have a stable coin hearing in Congress tomorrow. Can you give us a preview? Good morning. Yes, the Senate Banking Committee will be taking a look at stablecoins. We now have an updated witness list. Last week, there were just two names on it. Now, Dante Desparte, formerly of Libra slash DM and currently at Circle and working on USDC, will be on as well as Jay Masari, who is a lawyer with uh, Davis Polk and Wardwell. They'll be joining uh, Alexis Goldstein of the Open Markets Institute and Professor Hillary Allen of American University. And that's a pretty, uh, I think, fair and you know, relatively uh, balanced set of both skeptics and advocates for the stablecoin industry. So it should be an interesting hearing. Well, uh, Nick, it doesn't seem to, uh, outside of uh, 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 Circle, that they have brought in any other major uh, stablecoin issuers. And it's also asset-backed stablecoin issuers and not algo uh, stablecoin uh uh, entities, correct? I mean, uh, what exactly, why are they going the more, let's say, academic slash legal route? Well, I, I think, you know, the Senate Banking Committee has been uh, pounded by Senator Sherrod Brown, who has expressed concern about a lot of these projects. Uh, in particular, he uh, was one of the folks who signed his name to numerous letters warning Facebook about its work on Libra or DM now. And so, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a very healthy amount of skepticism about not just the projects themselves, but about the claims that, you know, stablecoins can do things like aid the underbanked or, uh, you know, streamline remittances, which is, you know, something we heard last week from Circle. So I would imagine that part of the questioning is going to just kind of focus on these claims and whether or not stablecoins can actually accomplish these, as well as, you know, how exactly it can do so given, you know, current limitations. As far as the, you know, algorithms back stablecoins, you know, I mean, I know there's a couple out there. I'm not sure any of them are, you know, currently uh, at a, a level of prominence that the banking committee would be as interested, right? I mean, USDC is sort of the most well-known based in the U.S. Uh, U.S. dollar stablecoin. I imagine others were probably, uh, probably invited, but, you know, as to whether or not uh, they will show up voluntarily. I think that's still an open question. Mm. All right. Well, I was really interested to hear last week's five-hour hearing, so I'm looking forward to hearing this one. Thank you, Nick, for 
Joining us, that was Coinos Managing Editor of Global Policy and Regulation, Nick Day. The Coindesk Spotlight is brought to you by Nexo, the place to earn on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and more. All right, it's been a blockbuster year for the blockchain industry with unicorns, that is companies worth $1 billion or more, doubling in the second half of this year. Blockchain co-investors, a venture fund of funds and co-investment program unveils a comprehensive list of the top unicorns. Joining us now is Matthew Lemerle, managing partner at Blockchain Co-Investors. Hello there, Matthew. Thanks for joining us. So regionally, North American blockchain companies saw the most value creation this year with 27 blockchain unicorns compared to a little more than half that in Asia. And that's surprising to me because I thought Asia was ahead of the curve. Uh, well, it's great to be here again, Christine. Thanks for having me back. Well, the facts are the facts. Uh, whilst uh, we think blockchain is a global phenomena and there's great teams and great opportunities in every part of the world, it is true that the biggest single concentration of the unicorns is in North America. So, uh, Matthew, what was the unifying factor with all of this? I, I mean, with all these unicorns, uh, obviously, North America seems to <laughs> being in North America seems to have been at least uh, many cases uh, an important ingredient. But what was the the if you could find anything that they all had in common? What was it? What drove that value to above a billion? Great, Lawrence. Uh, so look, let's stand back. This morning, you've already talked about uh, a number of different aspects of blockchain. You've talked about traded tokens. You've talked about stable coins. You've talked about uh, exchanges. You've talked about certain themes around the regulatory change in the environment. What's really going on here, if you can stand back, is that we're deploying a global innovation platform that complements the internet we have. The internet gave us global digital communications. Blockchain is giving us global digital monies and global digital assets. And in order to have digital monies and digital assets like security tokens, as you discussed in an earlier segment today, you need digital wallets, digital exchanges, digital custodians, digital settlement systems, dig digital payment systems, digital on and off ramps. It goes on and on and on. And all of that infrastructure, whether it's CFI or DeFi, all of that infrastructure has to be put together. And what tends to happen with all emerging technologies is it starts in the laboratory. We don't know what to do with it. For blockchain, that was 2000 and 12 and 13, when we first started getting investors uh, to be investors, it moves into a, uh, an, a time of great excitement, but not a lot of real use cases. That was like 2015 and 16 and the ICO boom and bust. And then we have real companies with real use cases, ma massive amounts of capital starts to arrive, the valuations go up. And we move into the early competitive phase and we're up the trajectory on value creation. And that's where we are right now. So as, as uh, Christine pointed out at the beginning of this segment, uh, at mid-year, we had 30 or so blockchain enterprise unicorns. Today, we have over 60. It's doubled in just six months. And it's going to double again next year. And we're also, on the slide that you're showing right now, we have an increasing number of public blockchain pure play companies. Uh, more coming, both through IPOs, direct listings, and SPACs. We actually have the largest uh, SPAC focused on blockchain, blockchain co-investors acquisition, SPAC 1. And we're going to see a lot of going public events. And that, in turn, allows for the creation of uh, public market vehicles, ETFs, ETPs, indices, and other things. And for the really big investors, that's when they can start deploying capital into the space. Matthew, were there any takeaways from this report that were surprising or unexpected to you? The pace. The pace is faster than we would have expected. Uh, the value creation in the blockchain space is accelerating. Uh, we're investors in 30 blockchain VCs in North America, Europe, and Asia. And it's a surprise to see the amounts of capital now flowing very, very fast into those fund managers. 
By the time you look at the late stage valuations, and here we're talking about uh, the rounds that are being backed by the soft banks and the tigers and the katuis and so on, uh, the valuations sometimes are enormously higher than we might have expected. I'll give you an example. Uh, Forte raising $720 million for an NFT platform with, we expect, we don't know for sure, a post money of probably three or four billion. These types of valuations we haven't seen uh, for a new emerging technology for quite a while. So Matthew, you predicted that there would be more than 10 new blockchain unicorns this year, far exceeded that expectation. What are your predictions for next year? Thanks. Yeah. So we're going through iterations ourselves. Uh, so on the one hand, in terms of the blockchain enterprise unicorns, these are really CFI, centralized companies that are deciding to raise equity and to operate like traditional tech companies. Uh, we expect at least 30 more blockchain unicorns in 2022. Uh, in terms of the crypto projects who are distributed, decentralized, and typically tokenized, we think the 133 crypto projects trading at more than a billion will also increase very substantially. Um, but we also think there may be shakeout there. We think that we're beginning to see the pulling ahead of certain protocols and layer two initiatives that people can clearly see are building out real technology and platforms. And we're seeing some of the purely speculative assets uh, dropping behind in 2022. And then the third uh, prediction is that there'll be a lot more public companies. So we expect uh, at least 10 more public blockchain pure play companies in 2022. And we think most of those will probably go public through SPACs. So Matthew, you also said that the highest returns still come from early stage, which is kind of uh, always been the case. Uh, it's also the highest risk. So if you're a smart developer, or you're an entrepreneur, or you're an investor, where, what, what type of company, what type of project, what type of technology do you think in this coming year will provide the highest returns among that group that will provide the highest returns? Yeah, thanks a lot, Lance. It's a great question. Um, so let's split. It depends who you're speaking to. If, you, if When I speak to investors, I will tell them the answer I have been telling people for 30 years uh, as an early stage tech investor here in Silicon Valley, which is the volatility and the, uh, and the uncertainty of the returns in early stage tech means that you need to be an early investor. You need to invest with the best investors in the category and you need to be highly diversified. And then you selectively follow on when you can see that one of your portfolio companies is looking more like an emerging unicorn, which is why we followed on to companies like Uphold and Brex and uh, Coinbase and Ripple and Securitize and Bitwise and so on. Uh, if I'm talking to an entrepreneur, then there's one, there's a big sort of fork in the road right at the beginning. Do you want to be a tokenized, decentralized, distributed, open source software development entrepreneur? Or do you want to be a more traditional tech company founder who's going to raise equity and go down that path? If, if an entrepreneur answers that question, then my answer changes. So if they're going down the tokenized path, then we still believe there's a lot of possibility in layer one protocols, in layer twos built on top to add functionality to layer one protocols, to uh, true DeFi platforms. We don't think that that is by any way a mature space. And also in emerging NFT and digital asset platforms. I would, I would call out those four if I was, if I was talking to an entrepreneur who wants to build a community of open source software developers. If I'm talking to the CEO of a true blockchain startup, then I would right now focus them in on digital monies, digital assets, and the building out of the global infrastructure to enable those things. And so it would still be digital wallets, digital exchanges, custodian solutions, settlement transfer, payment on and off ramps, and payment rails, et cetera. Because we are talking to a large extent about the internet of money 
and the complementing of TCPIP with an entirely new technology stack. Lawrence, so that's my answer to your question. Great. Matthew, thanks for the explanation. We'll see if those predictions play out next year. That was Blockchain Co-Investors Managing Partner, Matthew Lemerle. Time now to check in with Crypto Twitter for our Tweet of the Day. Crypto is culture. Crypto is a vibe. This is new and hip with all the money on one side. Crypto is culture. All right. Allow me to jumpstart your day with the words of Brad Sherman turned crypto song courtesy of Jonathan Mann, son, song a day man. It's already an NFT. We'll see if uh, he can make more music tomorrow at tomorrow's congressional hearing. Yeah. All right, that's it for First Mover. Thank you, Emily Parker and Lawrence Lewton. I'm your host, Christine Lee. I'll be back live at 3 p.m. with All About Bitcoin coming up at noon is The Hash. You're watching Coindesk TV. 